Well, hello there. This is Shane from Shane's Books and Review, and I hope that you are having a great day today. Today we're going to be talking about Philip K. Dick and a very unique book. It is A Scandler Darkly. Now, granted, this has come out a long time ago, but it was narrated by Paul Giamatti. Just a quick word on the narrations there. Paul Giamatti did a very good job with reading this book. I kind of associate him with just this greasy, bad character. I think that really lent itself well to this book. And the reason why I say that is it just, wow. Some of the character portrayals that he had that really lent itself well to the literature and the material. And since I already associate him with bad guys anyhow, that voice going along with this story just really, really did well. There was a couple of things that maybe I would have, if I was involved in the production, said maybe we should do this instead or do this instead. But I think that the choices in it were absolutely solid. And I think it was really, really just well done overall. So great job, Paul. Now, again, the book was wrote by Philip K. Dick, and the name of the story is As Scanner Darkly. Where do we even begin with this? Well, we start out with the book, and it's not the main character that we start out with. I think it was Robert Downing Jr. that played the character in the movie. In the first scene where he had all the bugs in his hair, uh, he was forever getting a shower <laughs> and washing his dog and all that kind of thing because he had aphids, and these aphids were killer aphids. Eventually, they'd get into his lungs and he'd be over. So this book has got a lot of very peculiar and unique individuals that are in it, which lends itself to a very unique and rich story environment. The main character in the book is Bob Archer. And Bob Archer is actually two people in the book. Fred, which is this undercover agent, and to the police he's known as Fred, or Special Agent Fred. To his friends and colleagues, he's known as Bob Archer. So the dichotomy of his character is that A, he's a police officer that is trying to work his way up the food chain to the point of which he gets the big bust. But also in doing this, he ends up getting so addled by the drug that he has a hard time trying to separate friends from whatever and starts to like the people. It's very obvious that he does enjoy being around his colleagues, not the police officers, and actually starts to dislike the police that he's working with. Now, there's this thing that he has to wear. Uh, it's it's a suit that's made from this really thin membrane uh, that a scientist invented quite by accident because he was subjected to a chemical that really put him in a very odd state of mind. He started seeing things like Picasso drawings just flashed on a wall in front of him for hours, and it was more drawings than Picasso, or more paintings than Picasso would have ever come out with. But it was just that continuous flashing of this and this and this and this and this. So he thought, wow, you know, to disguise oneself, you could really use this. So there's millions of permutations with like quarter and half base elements and this, that, and the other that ranges from female to male. So you would never actually see the same thing more than once in a person's life while they were wearing it or at least that's the way that I took it. Because most people wouldn't be able to recognize that flash after they just sit there and watched it over and over and over, right? But there's also some voice things that are in there. And this lends it, this makes it so that the story got this unique detail to it. So because of that, he's trying to bust people that are using this thing called Substance D. In order for him to do that, of course, he has to use it. So he's taking the drug and we watch him go down a very large rabbit hole, quite frankly. So the character Bob Archer is not necessarily a good guy, but not a bad guy. He's just trying to protect himself in a way because he is a police officer and so he has to give speeches of places and this, that, and the other. So our first diversion, there will be many, because this book is very detail oriented first time that he has an issue is that he <laughs> he's giving a speech and goes off script completely. You can tell that he's he's not quite right in the head. So substance D, what it causes in people that have been using it for a long time is the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain, uh, and then the ability for the visual cortex to say hi. Okay, so what you're seeing is this. So in some people, they just don't realize whenever they're looking at a bicycle for chance that has five gears on the back and two on the front, that that is a 10 speed because you've got the amount of gears on the back times two. Or if it's got three spokes, or three gears on the front, then that would be a 15 speed, etc. And so there's a, 
a scene where they're trying to work it out of, well, where's the rest of the gears? Where did the gears for this bike go? Where are they? And, and they just, it's just funny to see. But on the same token, it's really sad. There's a lot of that in this book. There's a lot of, of realism to the point at which I think that the details that are inside the book are based off of stuff that Philip K. Dick has experienced himself and that some of these characters may be based off of his friends. Long of it all is watching this Bob character go through these things whenever he had that speech and then he started to get put on a pedestal to be inspected by the police. Him being a police officer himself. So they don't know who he is because he always has to wear the suit whenever he's around other police officers or goes in to file his reports. And so Fred, AKA Bob, finds out that he himself is under suspicion for being one of the biggest dealers around. It's just that he uses so much of it, he's going down this big toilet circling and he sees his life falling apart. So he's got to figure out ways to protect himself. So he has to, by direction of his superior, find interesting ways to edit this source material that they're recording so they can bust people. So he can't leave himself in all the time. He can't take himself all the time. And he finds that somebody is editing these, these things that he's in just to mess with him a little bit. Now, he's got a partner by the name of Donna. She is a very quirky individual as well. Uh, her thing is that she's not wanting to have any kind of sexual intercourse with anybody because she's trying to project her femininity, but not for the reasons that you would suspect. At first, it's because she says, yeah, I do a lot of this kind of a drug, so I have to make sure that uh, I don't have intercourse or something to that effect. But come to find out, it's because she wants to take four pounds of a drug inside of herself up to another country to sell. And that's her life ambition, her life goal. And she's not even old enough to buy alcohol yet, so there is that. But she's not who you think she is. So don't let the character and the first impressions of her get to you that much because she actually is Bob Archer's rock. She is his rock of Gibraltar, close enough. She is a person that Bob is constantly going back to, not only for her company, but because he's interested in her romantically, but his brain is so fried, he can't even figure out how to romantically approach the person he's most interested in, but finally has the courage to ask somebody, and they're like, flowers, real flowers, because he actually asked the question of fake flowers, and they're like, no, 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 make sure it's the real stuff. And so he does try in his very best way that he can and gets shot down pretty much immediately because she says he's too ugly. And I was like, well, wait a minute, what just happened here? And he kind of had the same thing. It caused a big fight. That was a very interesting scene. Now there's these other characters that are in the book as well that they're so well wrote. They're so well wrote in their quirkiness and peculiarities that the details that are there, it makes me really think, like I said before, that this person that these characters are based off of were people that Philip K. Dick may have known and that the experiences might have been something very close to life that he experienced. The main reason why I say that is because of this author's note at the end of the book. And I mean, just a loose paraphrase that's kind of misdirecting purposely is we all played with this. We got too close to the fire. We lost our wings, but it would be really nice if we could all fly again. You know, that kind of a thing. That was the, there was a sentiment and a seriousness and the sadness and authenticity that was behind his words that really made me think that this was something that was a big thing in his life that actually may have happened in one way or the other, fictionalized or not. So Bob finds out that he is under fire and that he's got to start participating in a little bit of CYA. He's got to cover his assets. He's got to make sure that he doesn't get busted. He's got to make sure that he doesn't get busted for something that he didn't really do because he's a police officer. But I didn't realize exactly how far down the rabbit hole we were going to go in this book. In this book, we have a lot of things that happen. There's so much detail. It's actually kind of mind boggling. And this is a book that I would certainly enjoy going back and reading again a second time for sure, because, well, third time, maybe even a fourth time, because of all those details. That's that's what sells this. Like, for instance, the first scene, uh, the gentleman that has the problem with the aphids, where him and a friend of his are trying to collect these aphids and put them into a jar and his friend stays with him all the way through the night helping him and then in the morning whenever they both get up they find out that the aphids are gone and then he goes to this recovery place it's just all these little things that that make the story because you know an actual friend would do that for you even if they thought that you were off kilter and just absolutely nuts 
At least I would hope a real friend would. <laughs> but that's not the only weird characters that are in it. There's even characters that are in the police officers area that are completely off base. That makes it interesting to see these things happening because everybody's so paranoid. It's almost like this Fahrenheit 451 type of a mentality that they're living inside of. I'm not saying that the rest of the book's world is like that, but in their circle, in their group, it most certainly is because these people are trying to bust these people and these people are paranoid because of it. So it's almost like they're living in their own little militarized state of trying to keep tabs of who's good, who's bad, and locking things down and that sort of a, a idea. Even to the point of there's some similarities between Fahrenheit 451 where if a person buys something for themselves, that's like a sin against the state. It's even kind of the same type of a back and forth between some of the characters in that regard, which was phenomenally interesting and different for this kind of a book. I haven't even really gotten into the like main crux of it yet. So <laughs> we've got Bob, we've got Donna, we've got the police officers that are working to figure out if he's even a viable police officer anymore, but they're also trying to bust him as the other person that he is outside of the police officers. And there's a point in the book where you think it's starting to drag. You're wrong, it's not. There's actually something getting ready to happen at that point. And then you find out just exactly how far down the hole Bob really is and what the plans for him are as him being Bob and Fred with the police department. The police department is suspecting that these recovery places are actually manufacturing the substance D thing. They get him to the point where he's even having problems remembering Donna, the person that he loves the most in life. He can't even remember her. And that's, he struggles with it. And he remembers her name at one point and he's like, oh yeah. And he has a good feeling and then it's gone. So I, I really feel bad about that. And I feel bad for him overall. As far as like being able to be, to have empathy with the characters, Phil K. Dick did a incredible job with this. And his books are usually raw. And this one most certainly is. They're usually in your face. And this one in some points really is. It tells a different side of a story than what you would expect to see, which was very different and very unique. So would I recommend it? Is it worth your time, efforts, and energies? I really think that it is, most certainly. <sighs> now, mm -hmm. what are some of the feelings that this book brought out? Well, interpretation, sadness. There was a lot of sadness for me in this book, uh, simply because I had some experiences whenever I was younger, hanging out with the wrong people, at the wrong places, and the wrong times. And I had faith in them, but they would be upfront and would have the same moral code that I did and would be honest about what was happening around them. And they didn't. So I got in some trouble because they were very self-serving, selfish individuals, which really sucked. But it also taught me some very valuable things about life. So I can relate to some of the ways that these characters were behaving. And it, it, was, it was a kick in the teeth. I expected it but I didn't expect it to get to me as much as it did. And it really did. And now, is it going to cause me to want to hang out with these people? No, because they fried their rear ends with me a long time ago whenever they lied. And that was whenever I kind of hit that reset button. And this is also one of those things that I've mentioned in previous videos where people, whenever I was younger, told me, no, you never will, you won't be, you can't be, you won't ever amount to anything. And I'm like, no, no, I am, I will, and I can, and you're wrong. Mainly because I'm stubborn, but I also know what is inside of me and what I'm capable of doing. So yeah, I'm, I'm not, it, it was introspective is what I'm getting at there. It brought me back around to those times whenever I was in my early 20s and just how fortunate I was for that one incident to occur so that I could write all that off. Because some people don't get that opportunity. And yes, it was an opportunity. So that's what we're gonna say about that and move on. Hmm. Hmm. Now for the question of the week. Oh, this one's kind of interesting, I think. What was a book that you read? It doesn't have to be a recent book, but a book that you read that had these sorts of details in it that you feel like the author had some sort of experience with it. And it can be incredibly fictionalized and out there sci-fi, or it can be fictional in the way that you would write something to protect yourself and people around you. But what was that book for you? Because I would love to read more stuff like this because it really kind of caught me off guard and it was really well done and highly enjoyable because of that. For user callouts, we have Lynette and Lynette asked if there was a series just recently, this, this will show you how far out we might be recording, but she had mentioned that she was curious about some Philip 
Paul Wilson books. And if there was any standalones, there are. There's many series that this man has wrote, like Adversary series, Jack Reacher, The Young Jack Reacher, the Ice sequels. But then there was about eight or nine standalone books that he wrote. Uh, some of them were co-wrote with other authors. So Black Wind, Sibs, The Select, Implant, Virgin, Mirage, Deep as the Morrow, Night Kill, Mask, The Fifth Harmonic, Sims, Midnight Mass, and The Proteus Cure. The Proteus Cure. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a couple of these and read them. And Lynette, I'm going to invite you if you want to record something and just tell me that you do. And whenever we do the video, we'll have a little thing together if you like. I just want to make sure that I give you the appropriate nod because you've made so many comments over the years. It's so much appreciated. Thank you so much for engaging with us. It's it's awesome. It's incredible. I have really enjoyed that back and forth that we have had, uh, especially some of the recommendations that you've given, even if I haven't gone over them on the channel. It's really cool uh, because there's books that you've recommended that I've read that I would have never known existed. So that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, and if you don't want to, that's fine too. Uh, you can completely ignore it. I don't want to put you on any kind of something that's not comfortable. So that's, we'll just put that there. If you want to, just tell me and we'll reach out. All right, so beyond that though, what are some of the books we're going to have coming up? Well, we just recently covered Dune and I've got Dune Messiah. Also, I got another Scanner Darkly uh, book, which was The Minority Report and Other Stories. Uh, so it's got several things that are in there that we'll go over. We might actually split that one up because even though they're short in relation to like a Scanner Darkly or something a Stephen King would have wrote, there's so much, they're so rich. So it might be fair to split that out a little bit. And then also B.B. Larson came out with a new book, Glass World. Looking forward to that one. As far as I know right now, that's all that I have left in my queue. And then it's time to re-up again. <laughs> So, thank you so much. If you made it this far, it is much appreciated. You are a superhero. Thank you so much. It really is appreciated. If you have any questions, comments, anything that you want to say, down there, we'll get back with you. That's for sure.